So Luke, Acts for Beginners, lesson number eight. Title of this lesson, Jesus Faces Jerusalem, part number three. If you're following along in your Bible, open them up to Luke chapter 14, and that's where we're going to begin today. So we're in the third of four lessons examining the events taking place as Jesus is making His way from the north to the south on His way to Jerusalem. His ministry up to this point has mainly been in Galilee, close to His house in Capernaum, His home in Capernaum. But the time of His ultimate rejection and crucifixion is at hand and he makes his way to Jerusalem to face the mounting hostility of the religious leaders that are located there. This is seen in their attempts to denounce him for healing people on the Sabbath day. In the next section, Luke records a string of episodes where Jesus uses both parables and conventional teaching to instruct the people about the kingdom and other topics, but we know that the, the topic of the kingdom was Jesus' main talking point, if you wish. He talked a lot about the kingdom of God. Several of these teaching uh, points uh, and parables are only found in Luke, so we'll talk about those today. Now, since most of the socializing at that time was done over food, Jesus gives three parables, one concerning the guests and one about a host, and one about the dinner itself. So we begin with the parable of the dinner guests in chapter 14. Now all these parables are about various aspects of the kingdom of God. That's the thing that they have in common. In other parables, like the parable of the talents, for example, the main message was that the kingdom was at hand or the return of the king of the kingdom was unknown, so somebody needed to be ready, you know, faithful, productive, pure. In these parables, Jesus focuses on the attitude of the host and the guests. So let's bring, let's rather read chapter 14, beginning in verse seven. It says, and he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher then you will have honor in sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this parable springs from what Jesus was actually witnessing as people scrambled for honored positions at a wedding feast. The parable is self-explanatory insofar as the story goes, and the message is a, it's a familiar one that in the kingdom, the humble are exalted and the proud are brought low. For example, Matthew 23, 12 teaches the, the same idea. This is also an indirect denunciation of the religious leaders who, unlike the ordinary people, were too proud to receive Jesus, even with the testimony of His miracles. And this is one of the parables that is unique to uh, Luke. Another parable, or this time instructions to the host. So as a follow-up, Jesus addresses not only his host, but all those who practice hospitality. So let's read verses 12 to 14. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, there he is talking to the host now, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, otherwise they may also invite you in return and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So the way that the guests jostled you know, for position suggests that they were not among the poor and disadvantaged. You know, hospitality is a mark of one who is part of the kingdom, but a hospitality that serves not 
you know, not in a self-serving way. I'll invite somebody who's rich and wealthy and influential. I'll invite him, or her, uh, with the hopes that they will then invite me and you know, raise my position. The difference in attitude reflects the different objectives. For example, self-serving, you know, the self-serving goal is to advance one's position. The one who is serving someone else's goal is to advance the kingdom here on earth and this receives, Jesus says, a blessing from God. So we wrap it up in verse, or Jesus wraps it up here. He says, when one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So this comment serves as a kind of an amen. You know, Jesus sees what's going on. He comments on what's going on, you know, the people scrambling for position. Then he addresses the host and explains to him you know, how you should be as a host. Don't invite just the rich people who can serve your agenda. Invite other people so you can serve their agenda. And then one of the guests, you know, amen, that's right. I mean, this is what this particular passage is. Serves as an amen statement to what Jesus has just said and it's a bridge to the third parable about the kingdom using the story, again, of a dinner. It implicitly asks the question, well, who will be worthy to participate in the kingdom feast? You know, what does he say? Well, blessed are those who will be at that kingdom feast. And so the question that's not asked, but is there, is just exactly who is going to be at that kingdom feast? And so you have the parable of the dinner, Jesus does the parable of the dinner, don't have time to read, as I say, I ask you to read ahead, because we can't read all the passages here. Parable of the dinner, uh, verse 16 to 24. So this parable summarizes the situation taking place as Jesus approaches Jerusalem and what awaits Him there. And in this particular parable, I think you're familiar with it, the host is God. The dinner is the gospel message leading one to the kingdom. Yeah, I, think, I think we're familiar with this passage, if you've read it. If you haven't, this is the passage where the host uh, is, has invited guests and nobody shows up you know, the, of the ones that he's invited. So he sends his servant out and he says, well, go you know, invite the people, the poor, the lame. You know, I'm not going to waste the dinner. Let's get those people in here. And so the, the, the servant goes and gets those people. And then there's still room. So uh, the host says to his servant, well, go by the highways and the byways. You know, invite those people in, strangers. Just bring them all in. Let's just have the feast. So that, I think you're familiar now with that parable. So in that parable, uh, different individuals uh, fulfill different roles um, in the parable itself. So the host uh, you know, who's throwing the, the dinner, who's having the dinner, that's God. And the dinner is the gospel message leading one to the kingdom, the feast. And the lone slave sent to invite people is Jesus. And the original guests are the Jews, especially the religious leaders. And the poor and the crippled and the blind in the city, those are the ordinary Jews among the common people. And then the ones out on the highways and the byways, you know, the roads and the hedges, those are the Gentiles. So in this parable, Jesus summarizes his ministry to date, the initial response to it, and its eventual outcome. So the ministry to date and response, well, he preached, he performed miracles to prove that he was the Messiah and, in the kingdom of, and, the, and that the kingdom of God had arrived. And those who should have been first to realize and accept this did not. I can't impress on you, <laughs> I can't impress on you how blind they were. These are the religious teachers and leaders who knew the scriptures. They knew the things that the prophets said. They understood what the prophets said about you know, who the Messiah would be. They knew all the signs of what to look for. And yet they rejected him anyways. So like the guests who found all sorts of excuses you know, to avoid the dinner, these men found all manner of ways to discredit, attack, and finally have Jesus arrested and executed. And then also shows the outcome. His followers came, where, where did Jesus' followers come? Well, they came from ordinary people, right? Then and now. You know, Paul says, not many of you were rich. Talking about 
people in the church. Not many of you, he says, were rich or noble. And that's true, not many of us as Christians are you know, rich and noble, come from ordinary people. And eventually the meal, the message, was intended first for the Jews, but then was spread successfully among the Gentiles. And so the parable of that dinner is merely a reflection of what was happening in his ministry between himself and the Jews, himself preaching the gospel and how that gospel would, be, um, uh, would ultimately be accepted. So his final injunction warns those who refuse to believe, like those who were first invited to the dinner but didn't show up, so the injunction warns those who refuse to believe they will not enjoy the kingdom. Faith will always be required to experience or to taste the kingdom of God. You have to show up, he's saying. There isn't a second invitation. You get the invitation. The gospel message, that's the invitation. You reject that invitation, there is no other invitation. There is no other dinner. There is no other kingdom in, in which you can enter. So we move on here to a test of discipleship. These parables naturally lead to a discussion about discipleship and its demands that, were, that is mentioned both in Matthew and Mark. Jesus leaves no doubt that disciples must renounce everything that they own, not in order to practice humility or asceticism, in his commentary on this passage, H. R. Linsky says that what Jesus demands here is non-reliance on anything that you possess, things, money, skills, in order to save you or to do God's work in establishing the kingdom. Jesus says here in Luke 14.33, and I'll read that in a moment, this particular passage is often used to make the point that would-be disciples need to count the cost before deciding to follow Jesus. This is a natural lesson stemming from Jesus' words. However, making an additional point that we have to give up all we have in order to be true disciples is not what Jesus is getting at here. I've heard people use this passage here to, you know, to demand that people give up certain things. Uh, you enjoy music, oh, you got you to give up. I, this is, personally, I remember being taught this, not, not in the Church of Christ, but you know, in my search, let's put it this way, one group, you, I like the music and I you know, played the guitar a little bit. Oh no, oh, that's verboten. You, know, you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you, you got to give up music, well, except religious music, you know, but any other form, you got to give that up. And they were very serious about, about that and the proof text that they used was this one right here, 1433. Like he said, you got to give everything up. What we must consider before we become disciples is that no matter what we possess, it isn't enough to pay for our sins. We have to rely on Jesus completely for this. And in addition to this, we can't become faithful and fruitful disciples based on what we possess, whether it's a skill or an experience. Again, we need the spiritual gifts, the spiritual help that only Jesus can provide in order to succeed and be fruitful in ministry. He says, so then none of you can be my disciples, my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. What isn't written here is give up all of his own possessions in exchange for his soul. That's not, that's not, you know, that's not what I'm demanding of you. You don't have to become uh, you don't have to become poor to be a disciple. You have to give up self-reliance to become a disciple. That's what you have to give up. It doesn't matter how much you have, if you're depending on that to save you, it's not going to work. If you're depending on that to prove your discipleship, it's not going to work. So in verse 34, 35, he says, therefore salt is good, but even if the salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus concludes with a comparison of disciples with salt. The idea is that just as salt is useful as salt and useless if it loses its, quote, saltiness, 
Disciples are useful and fruitful as disciples, but they become useless if they stop being and acting like disciples. So at first Jesus cautions one to consider the cost of discipleship. And what is it that you have to abandon? What, all your money? All your worldly goods? No. No, no, you have to abandon self-reliance on those things. That's what you have to abandon. And then establish the length of service. Well, how long is the service as a, as a disciple? Well, lifetime. And he compares that to salt. For your life. That's how you become a disciple and remain one. You know, salt, let's face it, salt never actually loses its saltiness. It's always salty. And disciples have no other life other than being disciples. That's the point. If salt even lost its saltiness, it would lose its only use. If disciples stop being disciples, well, they lose their value to God and their purpose in following God. And so he follows this, you know, this teaching on discipleship with some parables about things that are lost and things that are, uh, things that are found. Uh, the first one of which, uh, the lost sheep and then the lost coin, chapter 15. Let's read the first one, verse one to three. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So Luke changes the scene here and he sets up the occasion for the presentation of these parables concerning things lost and found. The three parables, are spoken as a response to the criticism he was receiving from the religious leaders because he not only ministered to sinners and tax collectors, outcasts with his teaching, which they eagerly received. You know, it says the tax collectors, they came and they wanted to hear what he had to say. But he also ate with them as he did with the Pharisees. It was okay with the Pharisees that he ate with them. But it wasn't okay with the Pharisees that he also ate with the sinners. That's the thing that really you know, got on their nerves. And so the religious leaders condemned and rejected these people as a lost cause. Jesus was strict in condemning these people's sins, but he also preached the gospel to them and encouraged them by associating with them socially. When I say socially, I'm not saying he shared in their sinfulness. There was no law against sharing a meal with someone who was a tax collector. There was no law against that. There may have been a social unwritten law. You just don't, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to be associated with, quote, those kinds of people. And Jesus was breaking that social law. So the first two parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, they're pretty straightforward examples of the naturalness of wanting to find a personal possession that is lost a sheep that is yours, a coin that is yours, and the effort that someone will put into the search, even though not all the sheep or all the coins that one possesses are actually lost. Only one of the hundred sheep is lost. Only one of the 10 coins is lost. Each parable, as we know, has a happy ending, as both sheep and coin are found, and the ones searching rejoice in their good fortune. Now the point made at the end of each parable explains why Jesus bothers making an effort to reach these outcasts. And that point is, they're written off. They're not worth the effort by these religious leaders. They're lost, what's the point? Our job's just managing the 99 that are saved. So speaking as one who is witness to what takes place in heaven, in other words, what Jesus says here is not a quote from some Old Testament prophet, it's a revelation from a heavenly witness, verse seven. He says, I tell you in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then in verse 10 he says, in the same way I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He's not quoting a prophet here. He's, he's making a revelation here. There's a difference. Only the, one in, only the one who has actually been in heaven knows what goes on in heaven. 
And so Jesus reveals to them what happens in heaven when one of these lost causes are actually brought home and saved. So he's teaching them the reason why he ministers to all men and women, including the outcasts. And the reason is every soul is precious to God and worthy of being sought after and saved. Every soul is precious. And the religious leaders placed a different value on each person based on, based on earthly criteria. Your family, your education, your position, your wealth, your culture. You know, the Jews were first in that category, in that estimation, and the Gentiles, they were last. That's how they you know, considered things. So Jesus' parable suggested that each soul had equal value. You know, Genesis taught that this is uh, become, uh, excuse me, uh, that this is because each soul is created in the image of God, not created in the image of man. Isn't that the great argument we use, just the base argument against abortion? Every, every, every human being, the moment it is conceived, bears the image of God. Every life is sacred. And actually, you know, you know, medical school, when doc, you know, doctors are trained, you know, they're trained that they're to give the same amount of care and, and effort to save a patient, uh, whether he is a, a, a triple murderer who has been shot by the police while he was trying to shoot a fourth person, they're going to try to save that guy's life as much as possible uh, uh, to saving, I don't know, some other righteous, uh, you know, the, somebody's mother-in-law that they love. You, you know what I'm saying? They don't, look at, they don't look at position. They see a human being, they go, you know, they give their, uh, all their efforts to save that individual, regardless of class or color or anything like that. Well, why is that? How, how, do, how, does, how did that you know, attitude develop? Because every individual has an innate value. That's what we believe as Christians. And this is what Jesus is teaching with this parable. There are no, quote, lost causes. There are no lost causes. Every individual is worthy of being sought out. Every individual is worthy of prayer and entreaty before God for their soul's salvation. So this is what, you know, this is what Jesus is teaching here. And if you were a Pharisee listening to what he said, this was, not <clears throat> this was not good news as far as you're concerned. Then he does another parable, this time the parable of the lost son, chapter 15. After two parables about lost objects, Jesus steps up his imagery about lost and found and tells the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. The word prodigal means wasteful. In this parable, he's going to include characters that represent each person present at the telling of the parable. Himself, the outcasts, the religious leaders, and how each plays a part in the lost and the found. So this, this parable here ties everything together, what he's teaching about lost and found and the attitude of all the people that are present. So let's begin reading. This one we will read. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything to eat. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, 
Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. So this parable only appears in Luke and is probably one of the best known of all the parables. As far as the lost and found parables, in this one what is lost is this young man's soul. His soul is lost. If you're a Jew and you've gotten to the point where you're feeding pigs and eating with the pigs, you can't, get, you can't go lower than that. This is a lost soul. He goes from being acceptable and safe in his father's house and becomes an outcast through his own sinfulness and foolishness. There's no searching because unlike objects, sheep and coins, this person, of course, as a man, has free will. His choices led to his lostness and his own choices will bring him back. And so the Father represents the Heavenly Father who is present in the form of Jesus. Just as Jesus ministered to and associated with the outcasts, the Father waits for His Son and receives Him back into the family when He returns. What He lost, a son, has returned to Him and He rejoices. Let's keep reading, shall we? Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he had received him back safe and sound. But, when he, became, but he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all, this, uh, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live was lost and has now been found. So the older brother personifies the Jewish leaders. True to tradition, legalistic in following the rules, working for a reward, but not inward faith, no inward love for God which would uh, you know, produce a kind of a merciful attitude outwardly. You have to have a merciful heart on the inside to demonstrate mercy on the outside. So the parable accurately describes the two sons or the two groups Jesus dealt with. The outcasts who sought reconciliation and the religious leaders who refused to see their needs. Both sons were lost. That's the lesson here. They were both lost. We always think, oh, the prodigal, he's the lost one. But the older brother was just as lost they were just lost for different reasons. One was lost for dissipation and immorality. The other was lost because of self-righteousness and pride. It's easy to send somebody to hell who's a drunk or an adulterer or a homosexual or a violent person. You know, it's easy to send that person to hell. We just don't realize that self-righteousness will get you there just as quickly. Pride will condemn you just as quickly. Hard heartedness will get you there just as quickly. The thing about this parable is that only one of them was found. Just the one was found. And so Jesus continues with another parable, this time parable of the unjust steward. Now although the parables have different characters and storylines, they all have a common thread a condemnation of the attitudes and actions of the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders. The parable of the unjust steward is no exception to this pattern. In verses um, one to 13, I'm not going to read that right away. This parable describes a steward or a manager who is audited and he's about to lose his job because of waste and mismanagement. Before he leaves, he reduces the amount owed by his different employers' uh, customers in order to gain favor with them after he's fired. So he's going to be fired. He brings in his, you know, his boss's 
uh, customer, how much does my boss owe you? you know, $4,000, well, I just make that $2,000. How much does he owe you? $12,000, well, just make that $1,000. Figuring when he's fired, he'll be able to go to these guys and they will, they will help them out. Now, Jesus doesn't condone his actions, but he remarks that the steward's actions to save his own skin was shrewd in a worldly way. And the Lord provides a parallel for disciples. So in verse nine it says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Now in the same way, disciples should use earthly wealth to make, earthly wealth rather, to make friends or converts among the poor and outcasts so that when it is no longer useful at death, you will be welcomed into heaven, not into their homes. The idea being that converts will be welcomed into heaven and you'll be welcomed into heaven as well because of what you have done. So this parable naturally leads to an admonition about actual use of worldly wealth. The thing I'm trying to get across here is that these things are all connected. Our problem is we have about 30, 35 minutes once a week, so we have to stop in the middle of everything and then pick it up again, but it's just one long connected thing. Okay? So this parable naturally leads to an admonition about the actual use of worldly wealth. The parable showed an unrighteous person using wealth in a shrewd and self-serving manner. In the admonition, Jesus instructs disciples about the proper attitude towards earthly wealth and a warning about the impossibility of trying to have both wealth and discipleship as equal priorities because they demand opposite things. No servant, he says, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will devote, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the Pharisees, listening to him, they dismiss him and what he has said concerning worldly wealth because Jesus has perfectly described their own greedy attitude about money. And so in response to their mocking, Jesus rebukes them, beginning in verse 15. Let's read that. He says, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. So first he condemns them as religious hypocrites who hide their greed behind the cloak of religious self-righteousness. And then he reminds them that now is the time of salvation, and even though they are not entering the kingdom, others are. You know, he's saying to them, oh, you're mocking me, you're laughing at me. I'm telling you that now is the time of the kingdom. And you see these people here, the tax collectors, all these people, they're entering into the kingdom, but you're not. That's what he's saying to them. And then thirdly, and this needs a little bit of you know, explanation, these Pharisees skirted around the law and they watered down many of its provisions in order to claim personal righteousness based on the law. An example of this, they would divorce their wives for no proper reason and claim that they were innocent of any wrongdoing because they fulfilled the requirement established by Moses to give their wives what was called a bill of divorcement. They also passed their wives around to one another. Do you see what's, what was going on here? One of these men would be tired of their wife. They didn't like the way she cooked. Something, some banal reason. They just decided, I don't want her anymore. And then they would give her a bill of divorcement and you know, throw her out. But on the inside and before society, they were saying, what did I do? I didn't do anything wrong. I fulfill the law, Moses said, to give a bill of divorcement. I have given, look, a proper bill, properly stamped and written out, and I have given her that. I'm, I'm good. 
I'm fine, I'm ready to get a new wife. So Jesus reminds them that they had no power or authority to change or water down the law because the law, unlike the material world, would never fail, would never change. He then applies the law to their illegitimate divorces, thus condemning them and demonstrating the power of God's word. So here he's not teaching in depth about marriage and divorce. He's only making a passing comment about it. He does give more teaching in Matthew 5 and 19, Mark chapter 10. Here he's making a simple and quick rebuke of these religious leaders' disregard for the permanence of marriage. Divorce for no reason whatsoever um, at, and then remarrying each other's wives. <laughs> this was forbidden, this was sinful. And he's reminding them of that. Okay, then the final thing, we're moving on here. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Again, don't have time to read all of this. After the, uh, there we go. After the pause during which Jesus addresses the Pharisees directly, the Lord recounts a second parable dealing with wealth and the dangers attached to it. This time it is not about the dishonest use of wealth for personal gain, you know, like the unjust steward, but the love of and the reliance on wealth that leads to greed and selfishness. So he tells the story, a rich man ignores a poor sick man who is laid at his door. Both of them die and the poor man goes to heaven and the rich man goes to hell or Hades. These two have a dialogue where the rich man begs for relief for his suffering and a message to warn his brothers about the suffering that he's experiencing. And these, of course, are refused. The parable has several lessons. First, the rich man was not condemned for his wealth. He was condemned for his selfishness and his lack of faith. Secondly, there is both life and joy or suffering after death. There's something that happens after death. One is good, one is not good. Some think this is a lesson on the afterlife, others only use it as a parable. Either way, it teaches exactly the same thing. The same lessons are taught, no matter if you think this is, this is how it happens, you know, people can talk to each other uh, after death, uh, whether you think that's a real life thing or it's just a parable, it doesn't matter, it teaches the same thing. Thirdly, Faith expressed in love is what saves us. The rich man wants an angel to warn his family and is told that if they don't believe Moses, you know, the witness sent by God to preach and lead and warn the Jews, then they'll not believe an additional witness even if he's raised from the dead. And this was to be true of most Jews when the apostles began preaching about Jesus and his resurrection. Most Jews didn't believe. So the Lord kind of wraps up his teaching through parables with a final warning and instructions to his disciples. Chapter 17, one and two, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. So the warning, the only thing worse than not having faith yourself is blocking someone else from coming to faith. Something that the religious leaders were, begun, were becoming quickly guilty of. The second warning in Luke chapter 17, verses three to 10, again, not time to read it, but instruction. Jesus closes out his teaching with admonitions to his disciples about their lives as disciples and what this consisted of. You're a disciple. What happens with disciples? Well, first of all, love for each other is seen primarily in the way they treat each other, gracefully, eager to forgive, uh, eager to forgive one another. Uh, secondly, faith believes that all things are possible with God. Faith believes and lives with the understanding that with God all things are possible, even uh, 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 casting a tree into the ocean with a simple command, with, an, uh, with faith, that, that is possible. And then thirdly, humility that recognizes our true and blessed position as life, in life as servants of God, just as Jesus who came to be a servant and not to be served. I am a servant of God, you are servants of God, that's who we are. So these attitudes were in stark contrast to the character and life of the religious leaders who had scoffed and rejected Jesus. So my, you know, 
all this stuff, and I know I'm going very quickly here, all this stuff you know, boils down to this is a discussion between Jesus and the religious leaders. The parables, the admonitions, the warnings, it's all about Him and them. We have to make that application first and then make modern applications. Now for sake of uh, the video, just stay with me. Let me wrap up a couple of lessons here and then we'll, we'll quit, okay? If there's any one lesson that we can draw from this varied mix of parables and teachings, it is this. The key to the meaning of the text is usually found in the text itself. For all you Bible students out there. The key to the meaning of the text is usually found in the text itself. In this section, there are only four main characters, Jesus, the outcasts, the disciples, and the religious leaders. All the conclusions, all the object lessons, all the applications must first be tied to one of these before you can tie them uh, to a modern person or application. All righty, that's just good Bible study. Try to figure out what's being taught, what's being you know, given here, what's the exchange between Jesus and these people. Once you figure that out, then you can take that and apply it in a modern sense. That's just good Bible study technique. All right, next week, Luke 17, 11 to chapter 18, verse 30. Okay, we're good, we're done. Thank you very much for your attention.